I'm just clicking. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now I'm going to pass it on to our presenters today that will be, be um, presenting and talking about BIPOC women in leadership roles and in the workplace with disabilities. Um, Tamika Sitchin Spruce is our lead in director. Felice Turner is our disability advocate. And Priscilla Connell is our bilingual disability advocate. Um, Tamika, if you want to start us off with introductions, please. Yes. So again, Tamika uh, Sitchin Spruce, uh, my pronouns is she, I, hers, and um, I've been uh, working um, as a full-time employee at FDRC for uh, two years now. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, contracted. I was uh, facilitating webinars mm -hmm. on being Black and disabled, and it all started from being part of the uh, lead, actually, here at FDRC as uh, a fellow been a fellow, I was a fellow, part of the fellowship of LEAD. So, uh, so that's a little bit for me that as far as with, uh, I do LEAD in, which works with uh, nonprofit leaders on discipline inclusion. And as far as my physical description, um, I've, I have brown skin, um, wearing, uh, have low black hair and a white and black a leopard sweater. Pass it to Felice. Hi, everyone. I'm Felice Turner. I am the disability specialist here at MDRC. I have been a part of the LEAD program as well as the LEAD IN program um, and aspects of our system technology program for about the past six months now. Um, I uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, I've been in this work, uh, aside from the past six months, uh, I worked in the disability community for about the past two or three years um, from on, a, on the professional side, um, more on the personal side, um, probably for about the last 10 years or so. Um, my physical description, I am an African-American, brown skin woman. Uh, I have braids that reach down about midway to my uh, shoulder. And I am wearing a black sweatshirt that says feisty and non-compliant. I'll pass it on to Priscilla. Hello, my name is Priscilla Cano. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I am a member of the LEAD and LEAD-IN team. I am the bilingual disability advocate for MDRC. And so I help both the Spanish speaking community and the English speaking community. I, um, my physical description is I am a La Latina woman who wears uh, black glasses. I have shoulder length hair and I am wearing a blue leopard print sweater. I have been doing advocacy work for greater part of my life. Um, professionally for the last few years, and I am happy to be here. So the the purpose, um, I'll continue with the purpose of this training is to give an introduction into the concepts that our programs train organizations and individuals on. What we will discuss has more in-depth training that we are unable to dive too deep into today due to the time. We encourage everyone to reach out if interested for more training sessions for your group or yourself. The image on the screen is um, three women with purple tops hugging with black hair. And the words, the words say women are always on the front, are always at the front of revolutions by Tatiana Campbell. Mm -hmm. MDRC's mission. Uh, MDRC cultivates disability pride and strengthens the disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. The image is our Michigan Disability Rights Coalition logo. 
I just programs. don't have a place for headphones. What is going on? Programs at MDRC, uh, like it was mentioned earlier, uh, the LEAD program, which is Leadership Engagement and Advocacy Development. Um, we provide BIPOC parents of children with IDD, which is Intellectual Developmental Disabilities, and adults with intellectual de developmental disabilities with the information, tools, and skills they need to develop leadership and advocacy skills to be an advocate for themselves and their children. Um, lead in, which is the Leadership Engagement and Advocacy Development Inclusive Network, is a program that creates community of practice supporting organizations that primarily serve BIPOC communities to reach their inclusion goals with their develop with developmental disabilities. Um, our leadership programs are funded by the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council, so uh, it will be referred to as the DD Council. Our agenda for today, so we've gone through the purpose and the goals, the history of unknown accomplishments of women of color with disabilities, uh, bring awareness of the barriers women of color with disabilities face in the workplace to highlight the way managers and people in places of power can create an inclusive workspace, workplace for women of color with disabilities, and then questions and clothing. And like we said, if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat or raise your hand or um, unmute yourself. So, uh why we keep it focusing on uh, IPAC women with disabilities and leadership? That might be, you know, some people's uh, question. And, and so um, there was a report uh, that was done by the Boston Consulting Group, and uh, they found that 33% of employees with disabilities were identified as BIPOC, which is Black, Black. Indigenous and people of color had their workplace accommodation requests met by the employer compared to 43% of employees who identified as white. So um, uh, also this they found that 58% uh, of BIPOC women felt included. Um, again, another one among all employees with disabilities, about 39% of BIPOC women and 41% of BIPOC men experienced harassment and discrimination compared to 27% uh, 20, of white men and 30% of white women. So you will find uh, oftentimes, you know, within the disability community, there are, you know, disparities based on race and gender, um, even, you know, again, about the disability community when you compare to the experiences of, you know, BIPOC, uh, disabled people, and, uh, you know, white disabled people. And so um, also of the types that, and, you know, in society, which will lay out the foundation, you know, for a lot what we're going to be discussing uh, in this presentation that, you know, people with disabilities, of course, are marginalized. And so when you put in, uh, you know, structural racism, sexism, uh, it's like, you know, LGBTQ, you know, we put uh, up how other marginalized identities that, you know, you experience all those different uh, forms of oppression. And so that's why, you know, we wanted to uplift uh, you know, the experiences of BIPOC uh, women with disabilities, particularly in leadership. Next slide. So just a little bit, uh, you know, we're going to talk about for a few minutes some of the history. And I love history. I'm a history buff, so, uh, you know, I love talking about this and so just, you know, highlight some uh, accomplishments of BIPOC women with disabilities in history. So uh, the first person is my personal hero, uh, Harriet Tubman. Um, if you did not know, she had, uh, had seizures as a result of being 
um, hit by her master. So we all know like Carrie Tubman, you know, was the Moses of, you know, her of her people that led hundreds of people to uh, freedom. So uh, Harriet Tubman. Um, another person is uh, Sejona Truth uh, that had a disability. Um, I believe her heart was uh, paralyzed of some sort. Um, also uh, based upon uh, from her uh, slave master. And so uh, she was another woman uh, who fought for uh, you know, African-Americans and also uh, for women's rights. Um, one of the well-known speeches that St. the Truth has done is a tired woman. Uh, that you know, it's just it's a great you know speech uh, about the uh, you know challenges that women you know face, and so uh, those are two great um, examples of of black women with disabilities. Give it to Priscilla. So I will be talking about um, Frida Kahlo, who was a um, Mexican artist. She was disabled with polio from childhood, but it was an accident that happened when she was, um, I believe, 20. That it was a that caused her to break her spine and her pelvis, causing metal rods to have to be put into her spine and pelvis. Um, that um, the that accident is what caused her to start painting because she was not able to um, get out of bed. She used her paintings to depict her pain and her struggle, and she was able to um, convey through her art her pain, her struggles, but also heal. And um, although she was married at the time to another very famous artist, um, she after death, she actually has transcended the, the fame of it, and she is actually now more well-known, and so is her art. Um, the other person is Danielle Bettis. She is a comedian slash actress who uh, uses her humor to try to make comedy more inclusive. She was also in an accident when she was 20 years old and lost her feet and is now in a wheelchair. Um, she started to get into comedy after that accident and she realized that the comedy space was not very um, accessible. So she used that platform to highlight inclusivity and diversity in media as well as films to make um, them all more inclusive of people with disabilities. Now to police. Okay, um, and I will talk about first Claudia Gordon. Claudia Gordon is the first African-American deaf lawyer in the United States and the first deaf graduate of American University's law school. She's uh, spent most of her career advocating for um, people and in particular women uh, with disabilities in the workplace. Uh, today, she is the senior accessibility strategy partner for T-Mobile's diversity, equity, and inclusion team. Uh, she is the picture uh, on the, I guess that's what that would be, the left. Um, she's a African-American brown-skinned woman with short hair. She is wearing a white dress in the picture with a black belt and a black and white, um, black and white uh, flower on the corner of her dress. She's also wearing a black necklace. Um, it looks like she's standing at a podium giving a speech. Um, there's a black and red curtain standing behind her. Um, and the next photo is Lois Curtis. Lois Curtis spent most of her life advocating on behalf of herself and other people with disabilities. She spent most of her life in and out of hospitals fighting for access to adequate healthcare options for people with disabilities and access to financial means to assist with healthcare. Um, she uh, was a plaintiff in the uh, Olmstead decision um, that uh, decided that uh, people with disabilities 
cannot be segregated from those without when it comes to hospitals uh, and other healthcare services. Um, she passed away in 2022. Um, uh, the photo of Lois Curtis that we have is a picture of her standing with President Barack Obama. Um, she is receiving an award. Um, she's standing, it looks like, in the Oval Office. Uh, there are a few individuals surrounding her. Um, there is a flag, an American flag in the back. Okay, next we have Stacey Milburn and Mia Mingus. They are two of the founders of the disability justice movement. Uh, disability justice is a social justice framework that emphasizes cross-liberation solidarity among all people with disabilities through an intersectional lens. Um, so the first picture we have is of Stacey Milburn. She is wearing black glasses. She also uh, has on uh, it looks like a black shirt with her hair and a ponytail. Um, Mia Mingus uh, is the picture next to her. She is wearing a gray shirt with black glasses. Um, it looks like she's in an outside setting. There are a variety of trees, um, trees and different types of shrubbery behind her. Um, we recognize these leaders uh, because we focus heavily on disability justice and consider ourselves to be advocates of disability justice. Uh, so we really like to focus in on these two women uh, as the foundation for a lot of the frameworks that we discuss. And then last, um, well, for me, is uh, Haven Grimba. David Grubba is a human, right, human rights lawyer advancing disability justice and the first deafblind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. Um, she wrote this amazing book called Haven, the Deafblind, uh, the, excuse me, the Deafblind Woman who conquered, the, who conquered Harvard Law. Uh, in the novel, there's this great uh, quote, I'm a Black woman, I'm also disabled. So I experienced both racism and ableism in a society that struggles with those two. Disability is an opportunity for innovation. If you face a challenge, that's an opportunity to come up with a brand new solution. And that solution could end up helping not only you, but the entire community. Um, the photo that we have of her uh, is the cover of her novel. Um, it is a photo of her close up wearing a blue dress. Um, she has her hair pulled to the side. The title of the novel uh, is kind of midway through her body. Um, again, the title, Haven, H-A-B-E-N, written in large letters under that in smaller letters, the deafblind woman who conquered Harvard Law um, with, again, her, her full name. So another person that we want to uplift and I uh, want to see also these um, women that we're highlighting currently is from the leaked in article, a uh, bad asterisk, A-S, uh, S-S, the way through the word, but it's a great article, uh, but uh, it's women with disabilities who are driving innovation. And so um, I'll make sure to put the link to the article in the chat so you can read uh, the full, you know, list of women. So just want to share that. Um, so this person, this woman is Donna Sankar. Uh, she is a chief engineering leader at Microsoft for over 15 years. Uh, she's also, also a fashion designer, book author, and a uh, popular speaker. Uh, she has been open about having dyslexia. And so uh, she says, I believe the 7.6 billion people we share this on earth with can and should develop technical skills to help achieve whatever goals they have. I believe tech is the ultimate equalizer. And so uh, she is um, a olive skinned woman. Uh, she's wearing 
of like a bright pink and yellow uh, dress. And she's sitting down uh, with, uh, see like in a space um, and she's smiling, smirky, smiling. And so um, that is her. Um, another person is Sam Latif. Uh, she is uh, work for Proctor Proctor Gamble, global accessibility leader, and she drives innovation across the, their product line. And so she was instrumental. Um, she has low vision, and so she was instrumental in helping Herbal Essence innovate um, a shampoo or you know conditioner that uh, based on uh, the texture changed the changing the texture so people of uh, low vision will be able to um, tell which one is which as far as the shampoo and conditioner. And so um, in form, she said, it dawned on me just how annoyed it was to try to find elastic band to pop on my shampoo bottles to, to distinguish them from the conditioner bottles. And I start wondering what p and g can, could do, as I knew there was millions of people with low vision in the world who must also be struggling with this. So she's definitely, is definitely um, an innovator um, in the space. Uh, she is wearing a black hijab, uh, wearing a uh, brown coat, a red and black um, shirt, and there's a PNG uh, logo in the back. Um, and the other person is Keisha uh, Timmons. Uh, well, she was a member uh, of the award-winning accessibility team um, at Verizon. Uh, she now works at Yahoo as a principal technical program manager. Uh, she really focuses on um, accessibility and universal design. And she also um, has a visual impairment. And so uh, those are just a few other women, but there are so many um, other women um, in this space, a few that i uh, glad to know, you know, as a friend. So uh, Anita Cameron, uh, Rebecca Torres, um, Alice Wong, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, Fanny Lou Hamer, Selena Gomez, Lolo Spitzer, Carrie Gray, Imani Babarian, and Senator Tammy Duckworth. So all these are women in uh, the disability uh, justice space and just in entertainment in other places who are doing tremendous work. And so, you know, those are just... Uh, little bit of you know the history makers and so right now we're going to uh just go into our personal of the experience as of you know BIPOC uh, women with disabilities and our experiences in the workplace and in leadership and so uh with me I have a uh spinal cord injury um, so I use a, a wheelchair and so, you know, I grew up, I was in a, a car accident when I was a, a baby. So I grew up with my disability. And so as I went into uh, the workplace, I had, uh, and still do uh, to some degree, have a very strong interest in uh, film and television and video production, the arts and those type of things. And so uh, I've been, when I was, trying to break into uh, the industry um, as far as with arts and film, um, I was oftentimes discouraged and um, even discriminated against from even going into uh, the field. Um, in particular, uh, after I graduated from high school, I wanted to go to um, a very well-known at the time um, broadcasting school. And so uh, they called a meeting and uh, everything and essentially 
told me that I could not attend their school uh, because of, of my disability and using a wheelchair and had all these excuses and such. And so uh, that, you know, was one of the clear, you know, times of, you know, where I was not allowed to, 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 to be um, involved in. I was younger at the time. I was 18, so uh, I wasn't an advocate as I am now, so I kind of let that be and let that go. But um, of course, now we know that is, you know, uh, against the ADA, but uh, very much discouraged from even going into the field. Uh, but as far as with uh, disability advocacy, uh, I got into that through the Miss Wheelchair Michigan competition. Um, I was not initially the winner, but I became the winner in 2006. I represented Michigan and uh, this Miss Wheelchair competition, which still, you know, in existence today, I think it has about in 30 states across uh, America, there's a Miss Wheelchair competition. So that was really the open the doors for me uh, because that was the first time that I even met uh, women with disabilities or, you know, women in wheelchairs or uh, use wheelchairs. And that was the first time I met Black women uh, like me. So uh, I was very instrumental uh, in my disability advocacy. Um, also, another thing that I experienced was when I got married and started having children, um, I was out of the workforce uh, for some years because of child care. That is uh, one of the major barriers for um, a lot of women, uh, you know, to enter into the workforce is that, you know, women, we oftentimes have to, you know, uh, stay home and, you know, due to, uh, you know, child care, you know, because it's really expensive and heavy too. It's like, at the time, like a thousand dollars. And so uh, that is a barrier for uh, many women and many families and something that I uh, personally um, experienced. Uh, but uh, with, you know, programs uh, like, uh, like LEAD that we currently um, offer the FDRC, I've um, partaken in that. I've also developed leadership skills. Um, yeah, Wayne State has a program uh, for advocates, for activists in the racial justice space. So I also partaken in that in uh, AmeriCorps uh, public allies as well. Uh, that's how I even got my first, you know, official job um, was uh, through America, uh, AmeriCorps public allies. So that's kind of like my journey. Um, I think that a lot of people, uh, you know, have experienced, you know, various of types of these things that I've experienced. So uh, that's just a little bit of what I had to go through. So I pass it to me. I think it's yeah, Priscilla. Okay. So um, I actually come from a family of uh, migrant farm workers. So I grew up moving between the state of Texas and Michigan. And um, my parents did agricultural work, which we were also encouraged to do. So I started working at the age of 12, picking all sorts of fruits and vegetables. I've um, done asparagus, blueberries, strawberries, um, apples, peppers, onions, all sorts of different um, agriculture work. And my family was very involved in the United Farm Workers Union advocacy. And then, but my personal advocacy journey didn't start until high school, where I served on different organizations that um, provided community service. I was also on the school, um, the school board for my local high school or my school district where I was an advocate for student organizations that wanted to bring things up to the school board. From there on when I went to college I went to Michigan State University and I joined many 
different organizations, the local um, Latinx organization that um, was for Latinx students. I was also part of the Resource Center for Persons with Disabilities. And um, I joined a sorority that was very community service-based and I did um, student parents on a mission because I was a student parent. Um, after college, I continued to work in service-based work. So I worked for um, migrant education and I also worked for different nonprofits that helped migrant and Latinx populations. Um, and then I went to work for my local school district, working with alternative and adult education, and moving on to elementary education as a behavior specialist, where I was able to see that there wasn't a lot of representation for Spanish speaking families to be able to advocate for their children who had um, disabilities or had different um, IEPs or any of those things. And that's what kind of pushed me into this role. I want to help my my community on a larger scale. Um, the, the, I have encountered biases and underappreciation of my skill set based on my disability. So I have a, what we call an invisible disability. But once I let people know what my disability is, the biases are very obvious. And um, people don't take you as seriously once they find out you have an a disability. So I've had to encounter that before. Um, I also, because I am bilingual, when I advocate for myself to either be paid more or um, to, you know, try to use that skill set, it's either undermined or um, not valued. So um, that's kind of been my experience with in the workplace, but I am now in a position where I feel like I'm making a difference, especially for my community, and I want to continue to do that. So now I will pass it off to Felice. Sorry, everyone. I was having a little bit of an issue. Um, so most of my work experience comes from the retail and nonprofit industries. Um, I can say that I've experienced uh, both racism and ableism uh, in both of those uh, both of those fields, um, and there was a lot of cross um, when it came to the racism and ableism that I experienced. Um, I would say uh, uh, supervisors not understanding disability or not understanding the need to provide accommodations. Uh, I had to advocate for myself a lot uh, throughout my work experience. Um, I've had shadows, uh, maybe. I remember one time uh, I was working at a retail store and I had gotten really sick for about a day or two and wasn't able to attend work after that. They started having people shadow me, um, people coming up to me throughout the day, checking on me. Um, so uh, it's been a prevalent issue throughout my work experience. Um, but it has heavily influenced why I do what I do um, here at MDRC. Um, as you know, as Priscilla and Samika have both shared, um, the work culture here. Um, is very inclusive. Uh, it allows us to not only assist um, those uh, with learning about disability justice, justice and accessibility and accommodations, um, but uh, we really, I think this is a place that really exemplifies uh, those standards to their employees as well. Um, my relationship with leadership and activism began in college. Um, I was a member of my university's Black Student Union. Uh, a group of friends and I saw that the Women's Issue Forum was no longer uh, was no longer uh, a part of the school's social groups. 
So we revamped the Women's Issue Forum uh, to expand its focus and not only focus on um, just women, um, because prior to that, uh, the focus seems to be heavily centered on white women and the issue and the issues of white cisgendered women um, or women who are biologically uh, female. Um, so after that, we started having these conversations about what did uh, feminism look like to us? What did uh, what were the women's issues that we wanted to bring up? And everything from um, sexual violence against women and people who are in the transgender community, um, women with disabilities. I believe we did like this coffee chat series at one point about women with disabilities. So college is really where my, my activist engine really started to, you know, kind of get itself going. Um, but again, I continue my leadership efforts through MDRC. Um, I also um, like to use blogging and writing as a tool for my activism. Okay, so barriers in the workplace. Um, we just wanted to know, um, and you can drop it in the chat, but um, we wanted to know what does inclusion mean to you. In the chat, Rashira said mentorship and support. Okay. Okay. Um, Lisa says like psychological safety. Tracy said belonging. Gail said being yourself. Um, Lisa also said the the ability to bring yourself to work and voice discom discomfort as well, sorry, as well as belonging. Um, Latrice, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong, Latrice, said true, true inclusion is having the experience of being valued and encouraged to bring your whole self to any meeting space while inviting others to do the same. I love that. <clears throat> Shad, said to be included in events, schools, companies, being helped to thrive in many different ways, to be supported, to get where you want to go. Okay, so a lot of these things are challenges that people with disabilities often face in the workplace, right? So uh, we tend to face discrimination, public benefit incentives, uh, some minimum wages, uh, we are often uh, paid uh, at a very low value. Barriers to competitive integrated employment, uh, inadequate paid leave and paid sick policies are among numerous barriers to employment dis disabled people face. Um, so I know Tamika mentioned earlier um, about um, having to take time off to take care of her children. Um, Inadequate paid leave is a huge issue right now among people with uh, disabilities and people who have uh, other medical illnesses. Um, again, um, barriers to competitive integrated employment, um, just um, and subminimum wages. Um, again, just all of those things are huge barriers um, to what we deal with uh, in non-inclusive workplace. 
mixed races. Um, and another big barrier as, as it relates to the intersections of ableism and sexism, uh, there was a really great uh, blog that was done from the National Partnership for Women and Girls. And um, it's, the blog was Disabled Women Face Unique Fears in Our Work. Our Sister Transformation Guide seeks to address them. So uh, this is a term that's kind of new, but it totally, you know, makes sense uh, when you think about it. But it's called occupational segregation. And so what that is, this extension of this is discrimination that leads to more economic inequity among disabled women of color. And so um, basically what it says is that, um, that, you know, people with disabilities, if you think about, you know, especially if you uh, grew up or had, grew up with your disability, when it comes to like high school and junior high, high school, thinking about what jobs and careers you know, that you can, uh, you know, be in those type of things. I know personally for me that it was kind of like, oh, you can only do this certain type of jobs. You know, uh, this will not be good for you. And so you kind of told, you know, it sometimes overtly uh, or inadvertently what type of job you can have based upon, you know, your disability, or, you know, there could be biases based upon, you know, your race and those type of things. And so um, oftentimes, uh, people with disabilities, um, and, and uh, we had, you know, women of color, um, and those type of things, you are often funneled into low-paid jobs, uh, jobs that's also undervalued in some sorts. Um, I know another example of, of this is that if you have a developmental uh, disabilities, that you're uh, oftentimes kind of bundled into like sheltered workshops or like working like in a Walmart and those type of things. And so um, you're not really given a choice or you're not really given uh, you know, opportunities to, you know, explore uh, other types of, you know, jobs and, or even entrepreneurship for, you know, for that matter. And so oftentimes, you know, these type of, you know, ways that you're funneled into different occupation is really rooted in stereotypes. It's rooted in sexism, uh, racism, and ableism. Uh, and so, you know, while disabled people are forced into undervalued jobs, need to be for disabled people going, going in. Uh, disabled women are also forced into undervalued jobs for women. And so, you know, when you have all those uh, type of ways of occupation segregation, you know, you're really limited with you know, the jobs that you could do. Um, also, uh, like, did you know that 10 occupations employ the most disabled women pay on average 41200 per year, which is less than, um, you know, wages when it comes to, you know, not disabled uh, men. And so even when you look at the wage gap, uh, we know that, the wage gap is there for, you know, women with not disabilities and men with not disabilities, but then when you get to women with disabilities and men and those type of things, uh, the disparities uh, exist. So uh, Rashia, Rashira said uh, uh, another example is uh, discrimination to work with kids. And so, um, yeah, that's very much, much true. So I don't know if, you know, if you can, um, you're free to put it to the chat or just think to yourself, what are other occupation segregation that you see that um, exists? You know, what do you see that 
the type of jobs that of the time, um, you know, people with disabilities, people with disabilities are forced into. So I'll just give you a minute to think about that. What other examples have you seen? While we're taking a moment, um, we did have something in the chat. The tree said attitudinal barriers are the most harmful types. It is our attitude that drives programmatic design. Um, and then Rashira said, yes, this, this, this is a very thing. Didn't know the term for it. Talking about occupational segregation. And also the comment about um, occupational segregation um, making it hard to discrimination on working with kids when you have a disability. Exactly. I've heard that too from other people that like, oh, you can't be a teacher, you know, those type of, of things, you know, that people have experienced for disabilities. And we know that disabled people can be teachers, you know, disabled people can be filmmakers, you know, we can do all those things, but uh, that's rooted in you know, racism, sexism, and ableism. Okay. At least it's said women with disabilities often forced into very structured roles, those that require a great, great deal of repetition. Yeah, part time jobs without benefits. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Okay, that's hard. So, um, so it's like you know we talked about uh, the barriers. Um, so and so we want to create. I mean, you know what, uh, nonprofits and business leaders to create uh, the inclusive a workplace. And so, you know, we talked about a little bit earlier of what, you know, examples of what inclusion is. So, you know, create a place of belonging and where people can be their full selves. And I know a lot of studies have shown that, uh, you know, businesses do well when, you know, it value their employees and uh, create a, a pleasant, you know, place to work and, you know, where people feel like uh, they belong and they're diverse. So uh, there are a lot of, you know, benefits and pluses for uh, companies to be um, inclusive. And so uh, one of the ways that, you know, we could do that is create disability women friendly uh, policies. So that is to end occupational uh, segregation. Uh, like I said before, we are too many times pushed into, you know, uh, pushed out of higher paid jobs and discouraged from either entering them in the first place. And so uh, some of the things that we can do and advocate for, um, as well as that we need more fellowship, mentorship, apprenticeship programs actively recruiting uh, women with disabilities, women of color with disabilities, you know, just people with disabilities in general to higher paid jobs. I know uh, STEM is, um, you know, that's, that's really going to be the future, the type of jobs um, that is going to be existing is going to be STEM related. And so, you know, it'd be awesome to see uh, you know, those type of programs, you know, recruiting, uh, you know, young people with disabilities uh, to, you know, to learn those various, uh, you know, STEM type of jobs. Uh, that's where innovation, off the time we spoke before that, you know, disability, you know, we're innovators in so many ways. So I see that as um, a sector that, uh, people with disabilities, women with disabilities can definitely uh, do well in. Um, and then uh, to end 
the age wage gap within the same occupation. Um, you know, that that's a given, you know, that needs to be uh, corrected. Uh, stop penalizing sick and per parental leave. Oftentimes you are, you know, given a short amount of window, uh, you know, as far as with when it comes to parental leave and you only give a certain amount of hours for sick leave. And so, um, you know, that that needs to 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 change. And um, I've also, when it comes to child care, I've seen um, some employee employers have like a daycare center or, you know, they may pay for a child care and those type of things. And so if that was, you know, available to me at the time when I was having, you know, um, raising my children, that would have been, you know, awesome for me that I could bring my children to the workplace or um, have some type of, of stipend or, you know, or such. Um, so that is another example. Um, another thing is raising the income ceiling for those who need medical benefits, you know, who's on SSI. And so that is, um, as we know, often like a trap for many uh, disabled people and it limits on how much money that you can even um, earn, you know, because of that you need those, uh, you know, benefits and such. So um, that is something that actively has disabled community um, that we can do. Um, I know um, in the uh, DC area, there are disabled advocates who are working with um, the, uh, or I think it was Maryland, that's working with their legislators to um, increase the income ceiling for those um, who are on um, SSI and SSDI as such. And also we need to end sheltered workshops. Um, that is, you know, another thing uh, that's given. I know that it's somewhat of a controversial, you know, uh, topic uh, within the disability community and is funded by major uh, corporations who use um, sheltered workshops, but, uh, you know, disabled people, you know, we don't, you know, deserve to, you know, work for pennies and of the dollar is such we need to be paid equitably um, as everyone else um, for whatever job that we do. So um, those are some of the things and ways that we can um, create more um, inclusive environment as it relates to uh, legislative and also uh, workplace policies. You want me to say it? I'm sorry. You can take it, please. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so hiring and the recruitment process. So make sure that you have accessible job postings. Uh, make sure that your outreach and networking with partners in the disability community make sure your job descriptions are accessible and make sure that you uh, offer accommodation. So disability justice in the workplace. Uh, disability justice in the workplace is creating a culture where people feel like they belong and included in all phases of the organization. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that our workspaces are fully inclusive to uh, all employees, um, to, to everyone who uh, belongs to the organization. Don't put profit over bodies. Allow self-care and better work, uh, work and life balance. One of the principles of disability justice is sustainability. So we want to make sure that we um, are... Um, allowing our bodies to rest 
so sometimes that can be um, a barrier when it comes to um, workplace justice. So um, really trying to implement uh, those those policies, um, a sustainability policy within uh, your organization. Also, another uh, proponent of disability justice is in anti-capitalist politics. So again, understanding that our bodies, um, uh, our our bodies don't outweigh profit. So understanding that um, we are more than what we produce provide job accommodations and access needs, um, providing job accommodations and access needs um, uh, is inclusive because um, it allows for everyone everyone to do um, their best work. Um, uh, I've experienced barriers and I know other people who have experienced barriers and getting um, access needs that they have requested simply because um, the rest of the organization may not have seen fit or didn't see that accommodation as benefiting everyone. Um, not realizing that those access needs and those accommodations um, allow us to do our best work. It allows us to be productive in a way that uh, best suits us, which, you know, when everyone, you know, works better when it benefits, you know, the employee, it benefits the entire company. And creating a system that elevates people with disabilities into leadership roles. Um, Priscilla uh, has this great quote about not only um, sitting at the table, but having a voice at the table. Um, so when we think about that, um, putting ourselves in, or not putting ourselves, but, you know, um, offering um, people with disabilities the opportunity to be in these positions of leadership and not just allowing them to sit at the table, but allowing their voices to be heard, listening to the concerns of um, people in the disability community, people in the workforce who have disabilities, really listening to what we are saying uh, and, and what we uh, feel we need for ourselves. Okay, uh, employment practices. Um, inclusive policies um, and our empl employment practices, policies written and to be followed for future employees, regardless of manager changes. That's huge um, understanding that simply because a policy was put in under a specific supervisor or a manager, we need policies that are going to transition between leadership. Um, make sure you have an inclusive board. Um, opportunities, again, opportunities and positions of leadership and power for people with disabilities. Again, going back to that, not only having a seat at the table, but having a voice at the table, um, having a range of uh, community of identities um, on, your, on your board to make your board as inclusive as possible. And celebrating inclusive holidays such as the American, as such as ADA Day or the Americans with Disabilities Act Day. Um, celebrating Pride Month, uh, celebrating um, a variety of holidays uh, that promote inclusivity. Uh, creating a welcoming and belonging work culture. So how do we do that? Uh, by, by creating committees and groups um, that, uh, that bring representation to um, to marginalized communities, speak link, uh, speak inclusively. Um, we want to make sure that we are uh, always using language that is not discriminatory and that includes um, all that we encounter. Staff awareness training centered on marginalized communities. Um, I'm really big on this one. Um, you know, not everything, uh, you don't just know it, right? You know, some people, you know, have to do the trainings. Um, some people uh, have to really study some of this stuff. And that's okay. You know, we're all, you know, coming, coming from wherever we're coming from. So staff awareness trainings are huge in helping people learn how to speak inclusively 
lot in talking about why it's important for um, why it's important for uh, leadership um, leadership to um, include those who belong to the community. Um, and then inclusion must start at the top. Um, again, going back to the table, um, if your lead, if your executives or the heads of your companies don't, um, don't provide an inclusive environment, then the, the organization as a whole won't be inclusive. So really starting from the top and allowing that trickle down effect to occur um, and create feelings of belonging. One of the best things I love about working at MDRC is that I feel like all aspects of my identities um, uh, is appreciated and valued. Um, I feel welcomed here. I feel like I belong here. Um, and again, when you when I, when you have a happy employee that creates, uh, you know, and promotes a better business or a better organization. So when your people feel like they belong and that they are welcomed in their workspace, it really uh, just brings about a more inclusive environment, a better environment. Latrice in the chat um, said, we also have to get comfortable with being in a space of discomfort. We have to know that we just might have been doing it wrong. When I say we, I mean leadership slash policy, policy makers in the orgs. Yes, Latrice, I love that. That was a great comment. I love that. I love that. Um, and then um, lastly, accessibility and accommodations. Um, that means physical inclusion, accessibility, um, for people who hey, may present with physical disabilities, digital inclusion and accessibility for your digital devices, your Zoom links, um, make sure your meetings are accessible, your social media is accessible, accessible, your mission statements online, provide accommodations for people with both visible and invisible disabilities, um, uh, people um, with uh, mental health disabilities, offering um, mental health days, um, offering programs within your uh, your benefits that allow for uh, therapy um, and uh, accommodations such as those, offer hybrid or fully remote work options. Sometimes it's just better for people to work um, work from home. Um, I know for me, I have a sensitivity to light and sound uh, that sometimes is not conducive to uh, a work environment where there are a lot of people because I may have to adjust the lighting um, to, to benefit me so I can work from, you know, a level of comfort um, and also offering accessible social events. And what I mean by that is, you know, Everyone may, you know, we all have outside of work events that still pertain to uh, to where we work. So um, maybe there's an after work event, making sure that that event space is accessible. Or um, if you are going to uh, an outside event that is associated with work, um, maybe making sure that that space is accessible. Or if it's a virtual event, making sure, um, you know, finding out. Um, if the virtual event is accessible and what you can do to help your employees um, that need that accommodation. Yes, so uh, we see over the course of a little over an hour that you know, women with disabilities and BIPOC women with disabilities experience many barriers you know, because of race, gender, and disability. Um, however, these are, there are examples of women with disabilities uh, throughout history and now who are breaking the status quo and ceilings. So that's why I love, you know, talking about the history and uplifting the various stories of ourselves, but then, you know, um, you know, just everyone's story because we're showing that we're not, going to allow, you know, society uh, to limit us despite, you know, what they try to do. 
Um, and also, we need to make, though, at the same time, all systematic changes, while legislators need to create, you know, to change policies that hinders, you know, women and people with disabilities in the workspace, workplace, and employers need to operate from a disability justice uh, work frame or framework. Um, so, you know, you know, together, you know, we can create a world that BIPOC women with disabilities and everyone for that matter, um, you know, can succeed. So I hope, you know, everyone enjoyed uh, the presentation. So we're going to open up for, uh, you know, comments and, and questions, you know, that you may have. So, you know, you're free to um, unmute or, you know, put it in the chat. Tamika, oh, I I just want to add to kind of comfortable in spaces of discomfort. Also, like acknowledge within ourselves to to beat out that um, imposter syndrome. You know that feeling like we 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 have value to add to a space. And although it happens a lot to um, people of color, but it also happens to us as women, and it also happens to us as people with disabilities. So to that intersectionality of all three of those things that can kind of make you feel like you don't belong there. That's something that we as, as people have to work on. And once we are able to get past that, we are able to um, then push to, for all these changes to happen on a bigger scale. Yes, yes, yes. And I like what you said, Priscilla, that is very much, you know, true. That, you know, we definitely have, you know, a poster you know, syndrome, and, and yeah, it took me personally to, to get to a place where it's like, no, this is my passion, this is my talent, you know, so I'm going to do I belong there as everyone else, because yeah, society does put those, you know, limitations, so it does, um, goes back to, you know, recognizing your, you know, your power, you know, that we all have, and that we can do, you know, those things. And we do belong in every and all spaces and, you know, not be afraid to take that up and, you know, collectively, you know, make that change. And so uh, I see uh, Rebecca said, are there any resources to get once disabled or weird disease communities implement these systematic changes? Um, in our disabled and rare communities. Um, I know that there is, I'm, you know, Felice and Priscilla, I don't know if you have or how do they have any um, resources, but I just think it is first with um, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and making sure, you know, employers uh, follow those things is uh, the Jan is you know really great website. So that's the was the job accommodation network, um, and so that is a really great resource that work with um, employers to you know make sure that it's um, um, make sure they up to the ADA. I just put the askjan.org um, website in the chat. Um, I'll type it again so that it links. Sorry about that. But also, um, as far as like ways to implement the systemic changes, uh, we do have a couple of different programs um, at MDRC, um, like the LEAD Inclusive Network Program. Um, that one is where we are. Thanks, Abby, for putting that in the chat. Um, that program is where we are working with um, up to four different organizations on how to make these type of changes within their organization. Um, and that is like a year long program where we provide technical assistance on ways that they can uh, make these changes for 
um, internally for their employees and then also for the people that they serve. Um, and we have our Leaders for Inclusion program that goes out and does different trainings um, and also provides technical assistance um, to organizations and also to um, just different groups and will basically give you the tools and let you know about different resources that, that is available and out there to start making these type of changes within the community. Um, and then we also have our assistive technology program. Um, that program is more um, focused on the accessibility and the different accommodations. And the assistive technology program also provides um, technical assistance and can give more information on the type of um, AT for the workplace, um, AT for school, um, and just a assistive technology in general for daily living um, activities. So um, those are a couple resources in Michigan just from MDRC alone. Um, so uh, I think the previous slide had our general um, email. It's info, I-N-F-O, at mymdrc.org. So if you wanted to reach out um, to us for a training or for more information and resources, um, we can also provide that too, because some, some of the other resources depends on the county and the area that you're in too. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing some stuff in the chat. One second. Okay, so I put the evaluation survey link in the chat for everyone. Um, Lisa also said, are there any tips you might offer for communication when you find you are being treated with bias? Um, I can take that one a little bit. Um, so what I've found helpful um, is sometimes having to have a one-on-one -on -one personal conversation with your supervisor. Sometimes that doesn't always um, go as planned um, or go the way you want it to. And that, in that case, um, Tamika mentioned uh, JAN, job, the Job Accommodation Network. Um, I've had uh, a lot of clients uh, who have gone through Jan and have found Jan to be helpful. And um, they will, when you email Jan, uh, you email them your issue or you can email them your question and they uh, will provide you with resources. Um, they may even be able to provide you with some language. Um, and going to your employer to ask for accommodations or to ask for the um, accessibility requirements that you need. Um, but again, uh, for just, um, I found it helpful to at least start with a one on one conversation um, and then kind of work your way down from there. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I would see that as well. And then the, uh, he, Oh, see the equal, um, the office, the equal opportunity office, you know, from the federal government, like that if you think that you really be like grossly discriminated against and, you know, those type of things that they, uh, you know, you can file a complaint with them um, as well. But yeah, I like what you said for me is that talking to the employer and, you know, um, and other places to, you know, try to uh, remedy the situation. But there are legal, you know, ramifications as well if if it's get too, you know, out of hand and discriminating against. I've always uh, emphasized like documentation, documenting the instances in which you know it's happening. Um, as much as we don't like to think about it, like gaslighting is real and people will try to tell you that it's, they, they didn't mean it a certain way or it didn't happen that way. But if you have documentation and you're able to present specific instances in which it happened, it's it's harder to combat the like, actual um, examples. Another thing is uh, whenever I've had issues before with with a person of power telling me something, um, I've always tried saying, 
like how something made me feel as opposed because people can tell you that that they didn't mean something a certain way but they can't tell you how you felt or how that made you feel they they don't have power over the way you felt from something that they said so um my biggest thing is always documentation and um when you when you say things make sure that it's it's well thought out not speaking from a place of of emotion, you know, strong emotions at the time. Um, I've gotten to the point where I kind of just call it out now, <laughs> especially with like microaggressions. Uh, I just, I call it out in the moment. It's, it's, um, it's become something that it, it's more common. I feel like I've encountered it more. So now I just, I just ask, what do you mean by that? Yeah. This is Leah Trish. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Awesome. I well, I just figured I would unmute instead of writing a whole book in the chat. I <laughs> just wanted to say that um, this was an amazing uh, presentation. Like just all the feels for one being in a group where uh, people can actually relate to and name different lived experiences that we as uh, participants have had like occupational segregation like the fact that that is a thing it's exciting to be in this space but it's also like infuriating that we know for a fact that it has been going on for uh, you know just centuries and is going to continue until we figure out a way to get everybody on board and but you know People don't, they're, they're, they're not ready. So I just wanted to just say that I am truly appreciative to you all for sharing this space and um, presenting this in a way that is easy to understand. And we're, um, and another thing just to lift up uh, committees. And I'm not sure if anybody else has had experience where a different community or just say, hey, well, can you be on our board or can you talk to this committee? And you're, you're lending your expertise, time and talent, but you're not being paid. So essentially you're being tokenized and perpetuating this. This people, disabled people don't deserve payment, at, you know, but we don't know that because of what we are being taught, you know, just coming up through the years. So just, I am just, you know, extremely grateful for orgs like MDRC for speaking that truth to that power and being some leaders. So great job. Thank you for coming out. Yes, yes, it's, you know, it's, it's, we, we know it. When I read the occupational of segregation, like, oh my goodness, like a light bulb just popped up, you know, on top of my head, like, oh my God, this is, makes so much sense, you know, and um, everything, but you know, we can, you know, fight against it now that we, you know, collectively came together. You know, there's a word for it. We can start, you know, calling it out more too and creating more opportunities. And that's what I'm grateful for, you know, my uh, position at MDRC to work with, you know, nonprofit leaders, uh, particularly in the uh, racial justice space, you know, in particular, because um, we need to, you know, collectively work together as, you know, organizations and as communities to force the change that needs to happen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, this is Rebecca Palmer. I had the question with the disabled and rare communities. And I just wanted to echo back what was um, said that this panel was amazing and I appreciate the words from all three of you. Um, I am a an assigned female at birth white uh, woman who has uh, a rare disease and a lot of comorbidities. And I have noticed in um, the plethora of family organizations where there's about 7,000 rare diseases worldwide, but in our individual rare disease groups, often those of us who are adults um, over 18 plus that are rare and we have multiple disabilities, we're often ignored, but at the same time, we're asked to give our space and our energy and participate. And the particular rare disease community I exist in, back in the 
80s and 90s, it was marketed as a blonde hair, blue eyed illness because of the history of the genetics being in predominantly Western European heritage. But that didn't mean that we have nobody that has the disease who is also African-American or African or Mexican or indigenous. Um, But the communities all exist within this uh, Western United States American or if they are global, um, I'm not sure about those countries as I only have lived experience in the United States of America. And it's it has now ceased in the 21st century to be like, oh, if you, the pallor of your of your child's skin, will that make sense? Um, your your kid has bluer eyes because even among those with Western European heritage, some are getting diagnosed with that have brown eyes or green eyes or or their hair color is different, but there's a significant delay in diagnosis if the child is diagnosed and they're from a minority racial group or ethnic group. And so there's really not a lot in regard to um, language translation. And that just dovetails into as we get more disabled, as we get older, and then regarding gender and sexuality. And so I am just so appreciative of the work you guys or you all um, put in and that this was a free resource. Um, I heard about it through my friend Ola Ojiwumi um, and I am so glad that I had the time today to connect. So just thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining us. We had a couple of comments in the chat. Um, Lisa said, Tamika is a tremendously talented leader. It is such a privilege to listen to your counsel. Incredible panel. Thank you all so much for sharing your expertise. Thank you, Lisa. And Rashira said, yeah, I have a rare disease too. There is strong belief within the rare disease connected to bioethics that they believe BIPOC people don't have rare disease. There's a lot of work to do in that space. Yes, I agree with Sherry, a lot of work to do. Um, and Gail said, thank you. Thank you, Gail, for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Rashira also said, great panel. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, on the screen, we do have um, the emails of all of the presenters. So all of the presenters emails are their first name and then at mymbrc.org. So Tamika, Felice and Priscilla. Um, also, again, you can um, reach out to us via our general um, MDRC email, which is info, info at mymdrc.org. Um, make sure you all stay connected with us, our Facebook page. Um, we put a lot of our information and um, promotion for our upcoming events and programming, um, facebook.com slash mymdrc. And then um, this presentation is being recorded and will be sent out to all of those that registered. And it will also be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is at M-I-D-I-S, D-I-S, right. Thanks again, everyone. Um, presenters, do you have any other closing remarks before we end out? Just thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Happy everyone. Happy History Month. Yes, happy Women's History Month. Thank you to our interpreter, Kim Harris. Thank you so much for being here today. And also our um, part captioner, live caption um, typer, Emily. Thank you so much, um, both of you, for spending the hour and a half with us. And to everyone that is watching on Facebook Live, thank you so much for joining us there too. Um, have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Chloe. Thank you for joining. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.